Good evening. My name is Deborah Williams. I am a professor and chair of uh, the Environmental Science and Sustainable Ag Department here at Johnson County Community College, and it's my pleasure uh, to join you in welcoming tonight's speaker for our Environmental Science Lecture Series. Um, the series is approximately uh, one and a half years old and was created in response to both our desire and the need um, to have public conversations about timely environmental topics. So over the past year and a half, we have featured ecologists, high-profile pro military veterans and policymakers, and an environmental historian to speak about the intractable issue of climate change, national security, and have recently expanded our conversation beyond the U.S. borders to consider Japan and the carbon age. And tonight, we continue that trend as we welcome Ms. Barbara Finnamore, a Senior Strategic Director of Asia, uh, from the National Resources Defense Council. Barbara Finnamore has nearly four decades of experience in environmental law and energy policy. In 1996, she founded NRDC's China program, the first clean energy program to be launched by an international NGO. She also served as president and chair of the Professional Association of China's Environment, or PACE, and it is the co and is the co-founder and president of the China-U.S. Energy Innovation Alliance. In 2017, uh, Finnamore was named a member of Foreign Policy's The U.S.-China 50, a group of 50 individuals who are powering the world's most complex and consequential relationship. She holds a JD with honors from Harvard Law School. Finnamore recently wrote uh, a NRDC book, Will China Save the Planet, uh, the same title of this talk, uh, on China's role in combating climate change. We have scheduled some time after the lecture for a, a reception, and if you are interested in obtaining a copy of her book, we have order forms available, and if you fill this out, we, it will, you will receive a 20% discount. Uh, we, will, we also plan to have her book on supply in our, our bookstore on campus. So please help me in welcoming Ms. Barbara Finnamore. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to see you all and to spend this uh, lovely evening with all of you. Um, very important topic in my mind, and I hope you will agree. In the last year, we have witnessed the strongest Atlantic hurricane to ever hit landfall with the most violent, destructive weather ever observed. We've had the heaviest rain and flooding in the continental U.S. in recorded history. I assume that means they didn't record Noah's Ark. And we've had one of the worst wildfire seasons in the United States, with one billion more acres under threat of wildfires similar to the one that destroyed most of Paradise, California last year. And that threat caused the public utility of Northern California to cut off power recently to 800,000 people just to avoid similar disaster. So it's undeniable we are in uncharted territory now. In the midst of a steadily worsening climate crisis, the likes of which we've never seen. Yet, we're also at the cusp of an enormous change in our global energy system, a, a change so profound that I would liken it to the switch from burning wood to burning fossil fuels two centuries ago. Switch to clean energy. And I believe it is also accelerating and unstoppable. But we need to dramatically scale up the pace of that switch and the scale of it if we're going to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. In fact, last, just about a year ago, the UN climate scientists issued a devastating wake-up call telling us all that unless we act now to cut our global CO2 emissions in half in the next decade, we're not going to have a chance of keeping those impacts to manageable levels. So can we make the change fast enough? 
The answer lies within all of us, every country, every state, every province, every city, every country, every individual needs to act and act now. And all politics is local. I'm delighted to learn that Kansas recently overtook Iowa as the leading wind power state in the nation. Did you know this? 34% of Kansas's electric power now comes from wind energy. And NRDC, particularly led by my colleague Ashok Gupta, who's here in Kansas City, is working with Kansas in the hopes of making it the first state in the nation to move to 100% zero carbon energy. <laughs> I hope you'll all work together with us on that wonderful goal. But one thing is clear, there will be no solution to our climate crisis without China. Where do I point here? There we go. I've been working in China for 30 years at the forefront of their evolution in terms of climate change. I was there when China, in the room, when China first stepped onto the international stage to serve as the voice of developing nations as they negotiated the Framework Convention on Climate Change. I was there in Copenhagen in 2009 when China was widely blamed for the failure of the global community to reach an international climate treaty. And I helped to promote a series of bilateral agreements between the United States and China in 2014-15 that helped pave the way for the, climate, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement and also accelerated the speed with which it entered into force. Here are China's Paris Agreement climate pledges, ones we never thought we would see. So what happened? What caused China's evolution from climate denier to clean energy leader? And now that the US federal government is stepping back from its climate leadership, many people are asking, Will China save the planet? And the answer remains to be seen. But the most important issue is coal. When I first moved to China in 1990, winter meant coal. And every year on October 15th, the government of Beijing and other northern cities would switch on the coal-powered heating system. And instantly, our faces would become covered with soot. And this picture brings me back, because this was a common occurrence, a common sight throughout the city. People were stockpiling coal, just loose coal, to use in their homes for cooking and heating. And in those days, within the city limits of Beijing were four large coal-fired power plants and the largest steel plant in the nation. I knew that coal was king from the moment I stepped foot in Beijing, but I didn't know that was just the beginning. Because 10 years later, when China joined the WTO, it, in the following decade, it tripled its coal consumption as it, to power its economic miracle. During that decade, it's never been seen before, China quadrupled its GDP. It quintupled its exports. It became the manufacturing hub of the world. And it launched the most ambitious and extensive urbanization program in history. So 
as a result, in 2006, long bef uh, earl much earlier than anyone had, had anticipated, China overtook the United States with the dubious honor of being the world's largest emitter of CO2 and greenhouse gases. And last year, China emitted more CO2 than the US and the European Union combined. But I, 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 I hasten to point out that China's per capita CO2 emissions are still far below those of us here in the United States. And China's cumulative CO2 emissions since the Industrial Revolution are still less than half those of us here. And that's important because CO2 emissions don't go away. They are still in the atmosphere, uh, contributing to our global climate budget. But coal is not only the leading source of China's CO2 emissions, responsible on its own for 20% of all global CO2 emissions, coal is also the leading source of China's devastating air pollution. And to my mind, that is the key factor in terms of China's evolution on the issue of climate change. Beginning in the mid-2000s, China began to realize that its single-minded focus on GDP was no longer enough to guarantee a good quality of life for its citizens. I mean, its development model was just focused on heavy industry, exports powered by coal, was just simply unsustainable. And it left a swath of environmental destruction in its wake. I'm talking about air pollution, but not just that. Water pollution, desertification, deforestation, every kind of environmental disaster was, uh, was getting worse and worse in China. But things really came to a head in 2013, the year that many people called uh, the year of the air apocalypse. Does anyone remember that? That was the year that air pollution got so bad in Beijing and other northern cities that you know, burned coal, that it was as if people were living in an airport smoking lounge. Breathing the air became so dangerous that it was as if every man, woman, and child in China was smoking one and a half cigarettes per hour. And, and per hour. And 4,000 people were dying from air pollution-related illness every day. So I remember people didn't understand that connection for many years because they didn't have data on how bad the air was. They used to say, oh, what a, what a foggy day. And I'd think, oh. But actually, one thing that brought, helped to bring about the change is the US Embassy decided to put an air quality monitor on the roof of the embassy because the families uh, living there were concerned about their children's health. And they started revealing to the public those results, the air quality uh, monitor. Then eventually the Chinese government began to release that same data and public concern mounted. That was when the government realized it had to take strong action. And so by the end of that year, China had launched this $250 billion air quality action plan. And it targeted coal. It targeted coal consumption in the most polluted cities and regions of the country with targets and timetables and limits and closures of plants, a whole range of measures. And my organization, NRDC, took our own steps. We brought together 20 of the most important stakeholder groups in China, the experts, the academics, the research industry, even the coal industry association. And together we mapped out a proposal to China for developing a national cap on coal consumption, a mandatory national cap on coal consumption. And it was adopted 
in their current five-year plan. <laughs> and the results were remarkable. Because after growing at a gallop for years, China's coal consumption and its CO2 emissions stabilized in 2013. And then they continued to drop for the next three years. And that's China in the yellow. And as a result, because of China's outside impact on global emissions, global CO2 emissions also began to stabilize, even as the global economy continued to grow. This is consistent with China's stated goals of moving its development model to what they call the new normal, slower growth, but higher quality growth, moving towards an economy that was focused on services, on innovation, and on clean technology. They were well on their way. But coal is a powerful incumbent. And in the past two years, China's coal use and CO2 emissions have begun to go up again with impacts on the global CO2 emissions. Even though, as you can see, it's still at a much slower rate before, and they have not come to that 2013 peak at this point. Many people wonder you may be too. Why? Why is it moving in the wrong direction? And there's a lot of reasons for that, but one that I would highlight to you is that China's economy is slowing. And that has emboldened the voices and the vested interest in China who want to slow down that transition to a low carbon economy. Who could that be? Well, one. Many people think that when China, the central government, snaps its fingers, everybody obeys, and that's how they're able to make change. And it's not quite that way, because one of the greatest resistors to change in China are actually local government leaders who have a saying that the mountain is high and the emperor is far away. So they like to go on their own, and for many, many years, they report to the central government and their performance was rated on how well they grew the economy. That's it. Forgetting environmental destruction. Even though that has changed on paper, many local government leaders think that is still how they're going to ensure their future career. So in 2014, the central government decided to streamline the bureaucracy, a notable goal. And one of the things they did was to delegate the approval power for, local, for coal plants to local governments, figuring they would know how many were needed. So look what happened in 2015. Local governments didn't look to see whether they needed any coal plants. They just rushed to approve as many as they could, thinking, ah, new jobs, new revenue, tax revenue. And they often own shares in local coal plants. So that's what happened. And the other reason this was easy for them to do is because at that time, and to a large extent today, building a coal plant in China is virtually risk-free because the rules of the grid were set up during the 2000s uh, economic boom years with the purpose of encouraging the building of as many new coal plants as possible to power that economic miracle. So coal plants, no matter how many you build, are guaranteed a certain number of operating hours and guaranteed a certain price, regardless of the availability of, cheap, of cleaner and cheaper alternatives. So that's what happened. And when the central government figured out what was happening, they ordered many of these plants to be shut down or canceled or not, op not opened, even if they had completed the construction. But local governments, as an NGO found out using satellite technology, in many cases continued to build these plants in secret. So that's where we are today. But there is a total overcapacity of coal plants in China. They've built too many. 
And with guaranteed operating hours, the average coal plant in China now only runs 50% of the time. They're just not needed. And 40% of China's coal plants are now operating at a loss. They just can't make money. And so what we think is happening is that maybe coal use will continue for a while, but it's probably going to plateau for a while. It's never going to go back to the boom years. And one of the main reasons for that, aside from the fact that what I've just described, there's just too many of them, is the clean energy revolution that China has launched domestically and throughout the world. These are some of the um, recommendations that my organization has uh, put in a report to the Chinese government, which their chief climate negotiator has read with great interest and says we're very helpful. Um, we believe that if they do follow these recommendations, China can peak its coal use as early as next year, just because there's too many plants. And if they were to close down those unneeded plants, they could save an estimated $210 billion, which could be used to build many more solar and wind plants. So let's talk about renewable energy. China has figured out, you know, everything it does, I'm convinced, is only because it's acting in what it perceives as its own national interest. And it has figured out that renewable energy is key not only to protecting the health of its people and the environment, but also because it's the largest market opportunity of the 21st century, and they're determined to lead the way. And I want to start with what we consider to be the cheapest, the cleanest, and the fastest energy resource anywhere in the world. Does anyone want to take a guess on what that is? Go ahead, Ashok. Energy efficiency. Energy efficiency. The energy not used, what we call megawatts, megawatts, always cheaper and faster to not use the energy. It saves you on your technology costs, saves uh, health impacts. It doesn't have all these life cycle environmental impacts. And NRDC was actually the first NGO to bring the concept of energy efficiency to China. At the time we started working there, China was single-mindedly focused on electrifying the country, not on saving electricity. But now, the International Energy Agency says that China is a global efficiency heavyweight, and that the policies that China has put in place since 2000 to save energy in buildings, in industry, in homes, is perhaps the single most important set of measures to reduce CO2 emissions in the entire world. They estimated that in 2017, China's energy efficiency drive saved as much CO2 as equals Jap Japan's entire emissions. It's enormous. And they're continuing to work on this. But they also, in starting in 2013, the year of the air apocalypse, that's the year that China overtook the U.S. as the leading global investor in clean energy. And that's continuing to take off. So in 2017, China invested as much in renewable energy as the next three global investors combined, the U.S., the EU, and Japan. Most people don't realize this when they're asked, who's the leader in clean energy? What would you think? China? No, it's not the one that comes to mind. But that's the situation that's just come up in the last few years. And China's investments, its R&D programs, its government procurement, its subsidies, its support for solar and wind power as strategic national industries has really started to pay off. 
because right now, China is the world leader in wind, in solar, and in most other forms of renewable energy. Last year, I mean, last year China's solar production alone was more than the entire uh, electricity production of the UK and the Netherlands combined, all sources of energy combined. And that was the year that China installed as much solar power as the entire world had seen two years earlier. In, by next year, China is going to have three times as much solar power as us here in the United States. How did this happen? Well, it's an exciting story because 10 years ago, China really didn't have a solar panel, a solar domestic industry at all. Um, but it was already manufacturing 95% of the panels in the world and exporting them to countries like Germany that had subsidies and programs. But with the 2008 global economic crisis, the bottom fell out of the market. Countries cut their subsidies. China had this glut of solar panels um, sitting there, and they decided then they had to do this domestic industry. And it just took off. It just took off. Now, The Trump administration put tariffs on solar panels a couple of years ago in the hopes that it would develop more jobs. But solar panel manufacturing right now is pretty much automated, so it wouldn't make a difference in that respect. But because China's in incredible investments in solar power, it has brought down the cost of solar panel in the last decade by 87%. And that meant that, believe it or not, in recent years, the fastest growing job category in the United States was, anyone want to guess? <laughs> solar energy installer. That's where the jobs are. That's where the jobs are. And the cost now of solar power has gotten so low that last year, China decided it didn't need to subsidize solar power anymore. And plus, it had a $19 billion shortfall in its renewable energy fund. It couldn't pay the subsidies. There were so many new coal plants coming up. So even after it cut the subsidies, it still added more than four times the solar power last year as the United States. Clearly need some tech support up here. OK. And what does this mean for all of us who are not solar panel installers? I believe that China's investments in solar, its promotion of solar, have fundamentally changed the eco economics of energy throughout the world. Solar power, which was always this niche very expensive option is projected to become the cheapest lower cost resource of energy in any country in most of the world in as little as 5 years it's already cheaper than gas fired power it's a lot cheaper than nuclear power and it's a, a tremendous amount cheaper than coal power using the carbon capture and sequestration technology that we would need in order to reduce and eliminate CO2 emissions from coal. It's even become cheaper than wind. So we are now at a point where we're starting to see throughout the world that it is becoming cheaper to just build new solar and wind plants than even to buy the coal for existing plants. And in China, 11 provinces now have reached what they call grid parity between solar and wind plants, with five more of their 30 provinces to follow. I mean, this is the clean energy revolution. Last year, China opened the world's largest floating solar power plant on top of a collapsed coal mine. 
to my mind, this is the best emblem of the clean energy revolution. But I couldn't help but show you the next slide as well. <laughs> Despite everything I said, however, we're just at the cusp of this clean energy revolution. The world's energy system is still two-thirds fossil fuel. Thanks to China, we appear to be on a path that could lead us globally to 50% renewables by 2050, which sounds good. However, the UN climate scientists say that's nowhere near enough. We have to get at least to a world energy system of 85% renewables by 2050. And China, like other countries, still faces a tremendous number of challenges to get to that level. Uh, some of the challenges result from the fact that they built solar plants so fast and wind that they don't yet have all the transmission lines needed to take them to market. Some of it is that local governments don't want to pay for electricity from other provinces, that protectionism we talked about before. Some of it is technological, and some of it is something we share here in the US, the need to create a more flexible grid, the grid of the 21st century that can integrate all of that renewable energy and has a way of addressing the issue of variable power, power that uh, is not always available when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining. shining. Now, China is working on this through its energy storage pro investments, again, more than any other country, and they're bringing down the cost of, pro, of batteries that could, and systems that can actually store that clean energy until it's needed. But we have a long way to go. One other way that China is really pushing forward the clean energy revolution is electric vehicles. And I love this slide because this brings me back to when I was living in Beijing, I was invited to speak at the first conference in China on environmental law. But it was in Wuhan, far, far away from Beijing. So I got a plane ticket. I got in the taxi to go to the airport. And it got stuck behind one of these horse and buggies, because there was only one lane going to the airport in those days. And I missed the plane. So I had to take an overnight train, like most of Chinese citizens. I got there just as the conference was ending, but they allowed me to give my presentation. <laughs> but this is not that long ago that this is what we saw in China. Then we got to the point, if any of you have been there, where this, I mean, when I lived there, there were no private vehicles in Beijing. Then we got to the point that where there were so many that you could not travel. Um, it took you two, three hours to get across town. And it was in, guess what year, 2013, again, that China decided to launch what uh, New York Times journalist Tom Friedman called a moonshot to become the world leader in electric vehicles. Now, why do you think that was? Again, China's acting in its own self-interest. Energy security is a big one. China does not want to be dependent on foreign oil. And they're, uh, Imports of oil, I guess, are jump-starting rapidly. They had to get away from that. The pollution from these ever-growing number of vehicles in the big cities was getting so bad that as they started to cut coal consumption, that became the leading source of pollution and human health impacts. But also, China recognized that it could never compete with the United States or Europe in manufacturing traditional gas-fueled vehicles. They're too complex. So they um, decided, we'll go all electric. It's very simple. It's really a chassis with a battery in it. And this is the fel fellow who spearheaded this whole effort, Mr. Wang Gan. And I, I, I put his picture up because many people have the impression that China is monolithic. These faceless bureaucrats make all the decisions. But just like here, in this country, in this 
city, in this room, individuals make a huge difference. And so did he. I met him when he was an automotive engineer who had just returned from Europe, where he worked at Audi, to his native Shanghai to head up this new clean energy vehicle program, actually for fuel cell vehicles. And my group was helping him promote this new technology. So I was invited to test drive China's first fuel cell prototype vehicle. And I must say that Rube Goldberg would have been proud. It was just a mess. But he persevered. And he kept going to Beijing to get more funding for his vision of clean energy vehicles. And he was so successful that he not only was promoted to become president of his university, but he was then brought to China, to Beijing, to become the minister of science and technology, which he kept at until last year. So that's when he single-handedly um, dictated and led this moonshot. So just in the last six years, China has spent $60 billion on electric vehicle subsidies, R&D, procurement, charging infrastructure. Half of the world's charging infrastructure is now in China. And China did something that I thought was very smart last year. Because it is now the world's leading vehicle market, it decided to leverage that power and issue new regulations based on California's, saying that any large global automaker that wished to sell cars in China's market had to ensure that a growing percentage of its fleet was what they call these new energy vehicles, electric, hybrid, fuel cell vehicles. And I never saw this uh, global manufacturer's jump to attention. Within weeks, every single one had announced new models. Volkswagen, 70 new models of electric vehicles in the next few years. And new investments, together totaling $300 billion in electric vehicles in the next five years. New joint ventures with Chinese companies. It is truly jump-starting the global market for EVs. Look at this here. So right now, China is the world leader in electric vehicles. 46% of all the world's electric vehicles are in China right now. It sold 1 million EVs last year. It expects to have 5 million on the road in the next few years and 7 million in uh, 2025. China also leads the world in electric buses. Do you know how much of the global electric bus fleet are in, are in China? 98%. And why is that? In part because, whereas in, in cities, I know Kansas City is transitioning to electric buses. Many cities are transitioning. When a bus goes out of service, they bring in an electric one. They're changing entire fleets to electric all at once. And the central government in May issued a requirement to every city in China that they have to come up with a plan for transiting, transitioning their entire bus fleet to electric in the next few years. China also leads the world in uh, electric two-wheeled vehicles and electric taxis and electric shared vehicles, China's version of Uber. Didi Chuxing is the largest investor in electric vehicles outside of the government, and they're also investing in charging stations. They see which way the wind is blowing. So once again, China's manufacturing of electric vehicles and the efforts it's putting into electric vehicle batteries has brought the cost down substantially, 85% since 2010 not just for China, but for the rest of the world. And we're at a point now, once again, where this clean technology will become cost competitive with traditional gas fuel vehicles 
in two to five years, according to some estimates. In some places, it's already there. And this is the most exciting part for me. We issued a report last year. We did a timetable, proposed timetable for the government on how it could completely phase out the internal combustion engine vehicles. And one of the provinces, Hainan Island, which is a big tourist location, has already pledged that they're going to go completely electric within the next few years. But the central government is now said that they are going to develop their own timetable. And they're doing research projects and pilot projects to completely ban the internal combustion engine. That's the clean energy revolution. But we're not there yet. Once again, all this development is still at the very beginning stages. And the world market is still very, very much gas fueled. But because of the um, progress that China has been making, again, EVs could reach, according to many estimates, 50% of our global car fleet in by 2050. Do you think that's enough? No, of course not. <laughs> The climate scientists, again, say we must get up to 30 to 65 percent of all transportation, all public transit, all freight, all trans trains by 2050. So we have a long, long way to go. And finally, I just want to say a few words about China's efforts overseas, because despite all the progress that it's making to reduce its CO2 emissions, its pollution, transitioning to clean energy domestically, it really needs to do the same for its investments abroad if we do, are to have a prayer of meeting our Paris climate goal. What is the Belt and Road Initiative? Has anyone heard of this? This is a name that China gave to its massive overseas infrastructure investment program which now covers, there's been memorandum of understanding with 126 countries around the world, which together uh, come up with two thirds of the world's population and one third of the world economy. Together, these recipient countries are currently responsible for 28% of global CO2 emissions. But the problem is that what type of infrastructure China is financing in these countries is going to make a huge difference. This is another important actor in China, Mr. Green Finance, Dr. Ma Jun. He just came, he's been largely responsible for China's development of the most comprehensive green finance package domestically in the world. But he is now dedicating his efforts to green the Belt and Road Initiative, because if China continues on the path of financing fossil fuel infrastructure, those countries could soon be responsible for 66% of global CO2 emissions, which would blast us past any chance of reaching our climate goals. And why? It's coal. China, along with Japan and Korea, is the largest investor of overseas coal projects in the world. Doesn't make sense, does it? Over one quarter of all the new coal plants that are being built in the world are financed by China, to the tune of some $10 billion a year. And about 102 coal plants are, are underway, under construction right now. Together, that equals Germany's total coal uh, capacity. It's enormous. Why is that? Why is that? I think a number of reasons. Um, China says that it is just going to give these countries what they want. It will comply with local standards. But local standards are often not developed enough to require clean energy. And many people don't know how fast solar and wind have come down in price. And many countries don't have 
that transmission infrastructure that you think you might need for clean energy, although I would argue that it doesn't require any transmission lines to put solar panels on your roof. And financing distributed solar in these poor developing countries could go a long way in helping them to overcome their po problems of poverty. The good news is that investments in clean energy through the Belt and Road Initiative by China are growing rapidly. Um, and it's telling to me that many of these projects, these renewable energy projects, are financed by private banks in China who understand that that's where the money is to be made, whereas the coal infrastructure is primarily financed by China's state-owned policy bank, leading one to question whether China is outsourcing its fossil fuel development through this Belt and Road Initiative. Now, China says that it wants to green the Belt and Road. It's developed a number of guidance documents, regulations, and so forth, but right now, they're mainly voluntary. There is, they fall in the category of corporate social responsibility, and the companies that are building these plants are themselves responsible for monitoring themselves, for reporting on how well they're doing. A lot more needs to be done. So NRDC has been invited by the Chinese government to join one of the 10 uh, working groups on greening the Belt and Road. And our particular area of expertise is law and regulations. NRDC was formed by a group of environmental lawyers in the early days, 50 years ago. Um, and here's a report that we came up with with some of our recommendations on how China, what China must do to really put some teeth into its mission of greening that Belt and Road. A lot of work needs to be done. And just briefly, there's a lot that can be done in the recipient countries as well in order to provide that kind of policy environment and also transparency, public uh, communication, getting community input and doing their due diligence to ensure that they don't get saddled with coal plants that are never going to recoup their investment and are going to put these countries deeper in debt. So in closing, I just wanted to show you, this is two pictures taken from the window of my office in Beijing just a couple of years ago, just five days apart even. And on the one side, of course, it's crystal clear the air. Many days are like that in Beijing. Um, you can see in the distance, no more coal plants, no more steel mill. But on other days, the air is still so bad that you cannot see the building across the street. And part of that is coal use in the rural areas outside of China. One province, Shandong, burns as much coal as the entire United States because it produces half of the world's cement and half of the world's steel. It's still the manufacturing center of the country. And in other rural areas outside of Beijing, people continue to use coal for heating and cooking. The government has tried uh, a major push to switch from coal to natural gas, but natural gas is a lot more expensive. People can't afford it. The infrastructure isn't there. And a couple of years ago, a lot of people in these towns shivered through the winter because the coal, plant, uh, the coal facilities were taken away and the natural gas infrastructure wasn't in there yet. So it's still, it's still a continuing challenge. I mean, to me, China burns as much coal as the rest of the world combined. It's not easy. It's like turning the Titanic away a couple of inches. But it takes a lot of time, but it's essential. It's essential to make things survivable. And so here, just in closing, some of the ways I've mentioned before that China is at a crossroads. Things, the decisions that it makes in the next few years on these and other issues are going to determine, really, to a large extent, the future of our life here on Earth. Whoops. Go back. Here's another picture I wanted to show you. These are the colleagues in my Beijing office. There's about 50 of them right now. They're 
scientists, lawyers, policy advocates, conservationists, and so forth. Many of them are Chinese citizens, and they understand that China is at a crossroads. And our China uh, Energy and Climate Team recently met with China's chief climate negotiator. We were invited to come and present on our coal cap project, and now we have an oil cap project. And, he, and we came up with specific recommendations for how China can strengthen its Paris climate targets, which every country is supposed to do by a year from now. And he was listening. So we hope we can make a difference. We have already, and there's a, we think we are poised to do a lot more. I'm very proud of my team. So as the climate crisis takes on more and more urgency, I urge you to read the book, share it with your friends, help us make a difference. Because right now, every year matters. Every action matters. Every degree of warming matters. Every person matters. And I want to leave you in closing with an ancient Chinese proverb that I probably made up. <laughs> when the winds of change blow, some people build walls. Other people build windmills. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we have time for some questions. Would anyone like to ask a question? Okay. I'll run this back to you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rick Randolph. Um, to what extent does the Chinese National Clean Power Plan depend on the new hydroelectric dams being built on the Tibetan Plateau? Very good question. I didn't mention hydropower because uh, many people do not include large dams, large hydro dams in the category of renewable energy because of their severe environmental impacts. And I suspect that's what you're referring to here, uh, the impacts of some of the dams that China has built. China has more hydropower, three times as much hydropower as any other country. And many of the major dam, most of the major dams in Asia originate in the northwest part of the country, China's dammed them all to the detriment of its downstream neighbors who are very concerned. Um, China's continuing to rely on hydropower, but I think it's a, uh, it's a, it's a situation of diminishing resources because as climate change continues, one of the areas in which China is most vulnerable is droughts. And we're already seeing that the water table is dropping in these rivers, and it's, they're not producing as much hydropower as they had anticipated, including the Three Gorges Dam, the world's largest dam on the Yangtze River. So unfortunately, it's still very much a part of their clean power plan. And when I showed you China's climate targets, you'll notice they're couched in terms of non-fossil energy. That includes hydropower, but we don't think it should be. There's a tremendous opportunity for small-scale dams to make a big difference in re reducing flooding, uh, which is one of the major purposes, and, and providing power. But they still are, you know, focusing on the really, really big dams with, dev with devastating impact in many, in many cases. Yeah, the U.S. military really views that situation as a really a tremendous flashpoint for conflict. Because yeah, the two nations, two of the nations downstream are nuclear armed, and uh, they've all been fighting wars down there anyhow. So no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. That's why we're pushing solar and wind so much. And the fact of the matter is, they're now cheaper than the hydropower too. So if you're looking at economics, and if China does reform its power sector, as it's trying to do to provide a level playing field for all forms of energy, solar and wind are going to win out. But there's vested interest, you know, the, uh, 
folks put building the hydro dams are, are very powerful. In fact, the heads of China's major state-owned um, enterprises in the fossil fuel area often have ministerial rank. So they're at the table when these regulations and decisions are being made in many cases. So it's not easy. Yes. People may be interested in how NRDC actually gets its work done in China. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, we got started here. We have a lot more staff here. I mean, 50 people is great in Beijing, but it's a huge country. How do we, how do, we do things differently? Why can we make a difference in China? And what should we be doing more in China as terms of how, what the next five or 10 yeah. years in terms of advocacy and change? Yes, because for yes. an international NGO, an American group in China, it's not easy. No, it's not easy. And it was really not easy for me to get started because when I first went to China, there was no such thing as an NGO, a non-government organization. I happened to be there because my husband was posted at the US Embassy and I had come from 10 years at NRDC. So I knew what a group like ours could do but nobody in China understood that. Um, so there, was a, there were no NGOs in China, and people thought we were investors in clean energy. It took years to explain what we really wanted to do, which was to catalyze progress, to help the Chinese government achieve its clean energy and sustainable development goals. And how do we do that in China is very, very different in the United States. In the United States, we're, uh, we litigate against polluters, against the government when it doesn't comply with the laws and regulations on the books. Uh, we lobby for better laws and better regulations. We work on complicated, complex policies of green financing. My colleague Ashok is a master in all of this, and I hope you'll get him to come back and speak about what he's doing here in the United States. But in China, as a foreign organization, we practice what we call soft advocacy. We, try, we started off by providing, being seen as a source of information on what are the best policies that have worked elsewhere, what are the best technologies, what are the best practices. And the Chinese people that we have dealt with are very pragmatic. They want to know what's worked elsewhere. And then we have tried to help them figure out how to adapt to those winning strategies to China's situation. Uh, we've had years and years of exchanges between Chinese experts and Chinese um, government leaders, local government leaders, national government leaders, and putting them in touch with the best minds here in the US. A, pretty much a two-way street now, um, because a lot of what China is doing is, is world class. So that's been a focus of ours. Um, but lately, our biggest strategy is to develop local champions, not us as the foreigners, but what we have done, as I said, in our coal cap project is bring together the experts that the Chinese government listens to when they develop their five-year plans, their laws, their regulations bring these groups together and strategize together on developing not just top-level policies like a national cap on coal consumption, but helping the government realize what that level should be, how it should be allocated to every province in China based on their circumstances, and they're very, very different, um, how to allocate it to cities, how to allocate it to different industrial sectors, and when the government wants to you know, shake its head and say, well, that can't be done, it's the Chinese experts who stand up and say, yes, it can. And that's who China listens to. But going forward in the next five to 10 years, it's very clear to me that we need to go one step further, just like we do in the United States. It's not enough to do as we did when we started out in the US to try and affect national policy. We need to work at the local level to help implement those policies, 
That's what Ashok is doing here. That's what NRDC is doing in 30 different states around the United States, helping cities to adopt their own climate programs. We need to work with cities and provinces in China, like the one I told you about, Shandong, burns as much coal as the entire United States. How are they going to implement that national cap? How are they going to ensure a just transition for the workers in the coal mines and in the fossil fuel industry and in the heavy industry, coal, uh, cement plants, steel mills? That's what we were already started doing that in four provinces. But it's just a few people, and we need to have so many more boots on the ground to really help them over the finish line. Other questions? While I'm walking back, I'm going to ask one. Um, there's a lot of students in the room, and I'm really excited to see that. And so one of the comments that you just made I thought was really um, helpful in making the case to students that um, there are courses you can take here. There are discipline areas that are very much needed. And so I was going to ask you at some point, you know, what advice would you give to the students in the room who are interested in the environment, but they think that you know some of these problems are big or that China's too far away. What advice would you would give students in terms of getting to that place where they realize individuals matter and what kinds of skills are most needed in solving these big global problems? <laughs> I'd like to turn it over to you, Ashok. You're the one working here in the US. Could you give advice? I give the, I'll students? bring the mic back, and then I'll come back. And I could talk about China if anybody wants to work there. Or it would be good for you to just talk about how early on you basically were brought into the field, your early experience working on issues here. And oh, sure. How, you know, how just being in front of the right person motivated you to, you know, at the first I'm point. happy to share that. I'm happy to share that because maybe one of the reasons I – I'm here today is I want to give back to you what I experienced. And it, I was a sophomore in college, uh, State University in New York, when I still, senior, uh, the spring of my sophomore year, still hadn't decided on a major. And I had one extra spot for class I needed to fill. And somebody said to me, Oh, I've got the perfect class for you. It's so easy. Environmental Studies 101. You'll love it. All it is is movies and guest speakers. I said, sign me up. Easy. And you know what? That those guest lectures and those movies changed my life. They ignited my brain uh, with the idea of ecology and how everything was related. I, I'd have never turned back. It was that class. So I'm hoping that when I talk about my book around the country, I can also get, ignite some of your, someone's passion to go along the same path as me. I actually was determined to become a marine biologist. But in my senior year, I took a class in environmental law. And this was not that long after Earth Day. I won't say how long. Um, there weren't many lawsuits on the environment, and, and most of them were brought by this strange organization called NRDC. I said, well, who is that? I learned more about it. I learned what they were doing, these path-breaking cases, and I said, that's what I want to do. I want to go to law school, work for NRDC, and sue those polluters, and that's what I did. That's why I went to law school. But, you know, the rocky road, as you all know, is. Uh, Moving from school to job is nothing new. And when I graduated, NRDC was very small, and they weren't hiring anybody right out of school. So I took a job with the US government in October of one year. And the following month, Ronald Reagan was elected <laughs> with a very anti-environmental agenda. And I was at the Interior Department. He hired someone there even who had spent his whole career suing the government to get rid of environmental regulations. And first thing he did was get rid of my uh, program of, for young lawyers. So that was six months into my first job. I was out on the street. But that meant I had six months of experience. So I went back to NRDC, and they hired me. <laughs> so never give up. Follow your passion. 
And you may wonder, why am I talking about China when I was an environmental litigator? Yes, you might wonder that. Well, if you were listening, you may recall I mentioned my husband working at the US Embassy. So right after I graduated law school, I met him. Next thing I he was just joining the Foreign Service. And next thing you know, we were in Beijing. That's random. But it was at a very exciting time when China was just, as I mentioned, stepping up to the plate and had decided that maybe sustainable development wasn't a plot by the West to keep China from developing. Maybe it really was in their own national self-interest. And that's when they first started uh, negotiating the climate treaty. So ICE got a job with the UN as a consultant at the very front lines of China's awakening. And many of the young Chinese officials that I met went on to become uh, top leaders in this area. But all I can say is I can't say I had my career mapped out. Um, life is what happens when you make other plans. So be open to it and, and follow, your, follow your own path. And if there is no path, you better well just blaze one of your own. That's what I think. I think that point, I mean, everybody at NRDC has a different story. I mean, NRDC is now 600 people. I mean, we started 50 years ago by a bunch of young lawyers from Yale and a couple other law firms who said we needed environmental laws. My colleagues wrote the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, all the enforcement that's happened. So it's been a, it's a great organization to work for. All of us who were interested in this topic wanted to work at NRDC. I think I applied for a job there every time I was in between jobs. But my two things that matter, you know, experience for me that were really key were my parents moved from India to DC when I was nine. But I was in DC public schools from 68 to 71. If you know your US history in 68 to 71 were amazing years of change in our politics and policy between civil rights and Vietnam and first Earth Day, oh, energy crisis in 73, soon after. So that was an incredible period if you wanted to care about things and issues. And I just also happened to be good at math and science. So for me, energy policy became an obvious thing I wanted to do. But my detour ended up being, I became a high school teacher for seven years. I learned more teaching high school, because I never studied environmental science in college. I was a physics major and then an economics major. I learned environmental science by teaching it for two years every day. It was a two-year program, and it was just the best learning I ever had. And it makes me, I think, the, the advocacy that I do now, it's because I, could, I was able to be a good teacher, I think. And when I talk to legislators and journalists, it's the ability to be able to talk about complicated topics in a way that people can understand and being able to listen and have the conversations because none of this is easy, but the teaching was key and it doesn't, you know, whatever you study, it's kind of, for me, that was what made me want to do policy and advocacy. And I always kept looking for jobs at NRDC. And eventually, somebody actually called me and asked me if I wanted to come and work at NRDC, which was Rob Watson, actually, believe it or not. My first partner in China. Exactly. So he just, I became friends with him. There was an opening, and they invited me. And, and I've been at NRDC since 91, and I've been able to, you know, the best part of being at NRDC, along with just being a good advocate, is being able to just hire people. And you, you know, there's just brilliant people out there. And I probably feel like I've hired 100, 150, 200 of them over my years at NRDC because that was my opportunity. So, uh, and then just last bit, you know, working at the state and local level is what I've always done. I, I know Washington, D.C., people think is where policy is made. But on energy, most of the policy is really made at the state level. The electric utilities are regulated by state commissions. That's where policy is made. 20 years I did that in the Northeast in New York. And when we moved here to Kansas City seven years ago, my wife and I, that's all I've been doing now is in Missouri and Kansas doing energy policy at the state level. That is super critical. We work in 50 different cities. And we're lucky at NRDC to be able to get the philanthropic support to do the work we do. I mean, we don't take corporate money. We don't take government money. We t we're very independent. The philanthropy is what supports us. 
but every person at NRDC has a great story to tell in terms of how they got to do what here. And I think for most of you, you'll find the path. It's just about, you know, sticking to it. And I, and I have been struck by the fact that environmental studies is such a broad umbrella. Um, you could go in so many different directions. Um, and at NRDC, we have economists, uh, we have scientists, we have medical doctors, we have public health advocates, we have uh, conservationists, we have development experts, we have communication experts, media people, social media experts who are all younger than us because we don't really understand the power of social media. I mean, there's just so many areas. And through my career, which actually I've also worked in a number of different agencies, um, I, I have often wished I'd studied more physics. I'd studied more chemistry, depending on what I was doing. Wish I'd studied more biology. Wish I'd actually been a marine biologist so I could protect the oceans. But there's so many directions that everybody has their own particular area. Um, that's one of the things I love about environment. Uh, engineering, I mean, you name it, you name it, you could go there. I totally agree with that. Very interdisciplinary and um, exciting because of that. So there's a place for all of you uh, and your skill set and your interests. Just kind of follow your bliss and take, take advantage of those serendipitous op opportunities because they could lead you uh, in a very, uh, down a very meaningful path. I don't know if I forgot my question or not. Uh, <laughs> um, I came in a little bit late. Maybe you covered oh, this at, at the beginning. Good. good evening. Good to see you, Barbara. And we'll be seeing more of each other later. But um, I know that you were part of the Paris Climate Accords in, what, 2015, when all those in the U.S. was a signatory to it, along with 132, 135 countries. Obviously, in the last 18 months or 24, 30 months, the U.S. has withdrawn, I don't think unilaterally, didn't Costa Rica or somebody, one other country did. But how, without getting into the real politics of it, and I'm sure we all have our opinions, has that had any effect on other countries or they just say, well, if they want to do it, fine, we're continuing to march on, on the agreement. Right. And I know it's hard not uh, to no, take the politics out of it. No, it's a very important question. It's a very important question. Um, and when Trump announced that he would withdraw from the Paris Agreement at the earliest possible opportunity, which really isn't until December 2020, um, China, along with just about every other country, vowed that that would not make a difference, that they would continue to meet their Paris climate pledges. Um, and that, they, as I said before, they have their own internal reasons for doing so, thank goodness. Uh, pollution, energy security, market access, and so forth. Um, but I have seen, as I mentioned before, every country is supposed to announce strengthened pledges by December 2020. And because if you add up all the pledges that every country made in Paris, it doesn't get us even one third of the way to our two degree goal. So every country has to step up more. And I'm not seeing it right now. And I can't help but wonder whether that is because of lack of US leadership in the climate negotiations. Um, and I also know from working in China that China does not want to be the sole leader. They didn't like the title of my book because China has another saying, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. And China feels like if it takes on that leadership role, that's going to be more pressure than it feels able to handle. Um, and so last June, um, I was glad to see at the G20 meeting that China and France issued, came out with a joint press release saying that together they, were, they had pledged to strengthen their climate pledges to reflect their highest degree of ambition. And also to come up with a 2050 low carbon development plan by next year, which is also a requirement of the Paris Agreement. But to be frank, China doesn't really care about France. That, France isn't going to put pressure on China to go further and faster the way we need to go. And so we're at a, 
you know, uh, there was a big climate summit in New York last month, and about 66 countries announced stronger climate targets, which we were very happy to see. But none of the big emitters were on that list. I'm going to add the local and state piece, which is really that there is a coalition of we are still in. So a lot of states and local governments and corporations and civil society in the U.S. has really still stepped up. I mean, they're doing a lot. And part of the messaging, we were talking about this the other day, is how can we organize a coalition of states that are speaking on behalf of the U.S. and not just have it be, you know, Washington, D.C. So there is this subnational effort. I mean, here at Johnson County Community College, you had a great summit a few weeks ago where 700 people attended, you know, organized by local elected officials. So part of figuring out how to send a message about where the U.S. is, it's not just about what is said about how we're no longer to be part of the Paris Climate Agreement, but if you look at the actual targets and emissions and what we need to do to get to those 2025 targets and show that we're going to hit those targets anyway. It's harder to message when your national leadership isn't there, but I think that's what's going on. I mean, this is being organized by lots of different people. I know Mayor Bloomberg is very actively involved in this. We are in effort. So there's different things going on. So there's a lot of state, local interests here that can, and the question is, can we get through. I know that Governor Brown was in China sending that message that, you know, California is definitely leading the way. A lot of, uh, there are more than half the states are stepping up in a big way. And I think even here, even though politically people may not think that you can talk about climate change very much, I thought the summit was a great example of the fact that people can. And if you look at what's really going on, on the ground, when I said that 35% of our electricity is coming from wind power, a lot of people don't know that. And it's really, in terms of achieving the clean power plant targets, even though that clean power plant never happened, we're going to hit the clean power plant targets in the U.S. regardless anyway, because those were probably pretty mediocre targets to hit. So I think there is good news in terms of what's going on on the ground. The question is how do we communicate that globally so people see that there's real progress happening here even though uh, rhetorically we look like we're stepping back. And as you can see, we need you. We need all of you in this fight. So I'm really glad to see you all here today. I think that's a, unless someone has a burning last question, I think that's a great point to end um, our discussion on. Uh, job security for environmental sciences, and physicians, and uh, mm -hmm. solar power technicians, policy makers. Uh, just know that everyone could potentially play a role, and it's much needed at this time Absolutely. with these global uh, issues. Thanks again so much. Thank you all. Thank you all.